First of all, let me say uh, good evening to everyone. Happy Wednesday evening to all of you that are, are watching, uh, those who are here tonight, and those who are chiming in as our uh, covenant partners. Uh, we're so glad to have you join us tonight. And we say grace and peace unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Goldsboro, North Carolina, here at Mount Calvary. And we're so happy for the ones that are here to see a smiling face. It's like people came here with smiles on their face and faces. And I know you at home. You've probably been working hard all day and just dealing with challenges all day. But we want you just to sit back and relax a little bit and, and chime into our broadcast. Um, we want to continue our study on um, memory and forgiveness are essential. Uh, they're very important. Our remembering the past to bring us to where we are now and to our future, but there are a couple of things that must be done in order to be found favorable in the sight of our God. So we're here tonight not to uh, keep you long, but we hope you have your pens, your notebooks, your pads, but most importantly your Bibles and your prayers with us, and so we can go ahead and, and dive into our lesson to talk about our topic for tonight. And the topic for tonight is Reconciliation, uh, you know, bringing back together again. And uh, those who have my syllabus, and uh, those who have, uh, who may not have them, uh, it's kind of lengthy a little bit. So I decided instead of trying to put it all into tonight, then we're going to stretch our series out for another Sunday, another excuse me, another Wednesday, uh, because it's very important that you get. Uh, what it means to reconcile or to be reconciled with one another. So again, let's get started. We don't want to keep you long tonight. And again, glad to have you join us. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Most holy and gracious God, our Father, uh, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for cover, covering us with your grace and mercy. And now, Father, I ask that you bless all the listeners uh, as we dwell and talk about what it means to be reconciled, reconciliation. And Father God, we pray that whatever is said tonight would be used for more than informational knowledge, but it will be used to reconcile with those we are estranged from. Yes, yes. And Father God, we realize that in your word you said that God was in Christ Jesus, uh, reconciling the world back unto himself. So the act of reconciliation is very important in our Christian ministry. So God, help us to get the knowledge and know-how so we can become one in fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Pursuing, pursuing reconciliation. Let's write that big word right there. Pursuing reconciliation. So it is an action word. That means we're trying to complete something. We're doing something in our walk with the Lord, in our walk with one another. So tonight we're going to, tonight and next Wednesday, we're going to deal with what it means to pursue or pursuing uh, reconciliation. Okay. You have to forgive my pants and... You have to forgive my pants tonight. I'm about to run out of writing so much in these last year and a half. Uh, two years since I've had my board really longer than that, that my pants are about to run out. But just bear with me. Those who have the syllabus, those who have your Bibles, just bear with me. And we're going to get through it tonight. Uh, for the last few weeks, my lessons have been on memory and forgiveness, how they are inseparable, and they are 
uh, essential to one another. <clears throat> so following that, we dwelled in what does it mean in memory and forgiveness. Well, the first thing I talked about a few weeks ago, lesson number one, I challenged everyone on the act of forgiving, forgiving one another. And we talked about that, we discussed that, and my whole lesson context comes from the story or the narrative of Joseph over in Genesis, somewhere in Genesis chapter 44, chapter 41, all the way to Genesis 50, we dealt with the story of Joseph. His story is so extensive, his story is so long, that's why we try to break it up into pieces and parts. Because if we had to do the whole story of Joseph, we would be here until next Sunday, okay? And I know Mark Carey loved me to death, but y'all don't want to see me till next Sunday. <laughs> and so we're going to break it up in pieces and parts. But a few weeks ago, lesson number one dealt with forgiving. We discussed that, how sometimes forgiving folk is hard, especially when it comes down to what happened between us and our past. And we talked about that. We talked about how Joseph went over and beyond dealing with his half-brothers. We talked about that. We talked about how Joseph saw the bigger picture. So it wasn't hard for him to forgive. He saw the bigger picture of what God was doing. Right? We know the story of Joseph. He was sold to the Midianites. His brothers put him in a pit. Uh, his brothers were jealous and envious that he was uh, Israel or Jacob's favorite son. And so they tried with all their might, even though one of the brothers, I think it was Reuben, that didn't want to sell him to slavery, but they did it anyway. Joseph went down and had a horrible time, right? He was put in jail. Uh, he was dehumanized. He was accused of doing stuff that he didn't do. But in the end, we learn what forgiveness was because he forgave his brothers. And the number one thing we learned a few weeks ago, that in forgiving one another, it's about the wrong. It's about the wrong and the wrongdoer. Coming together, those who were wrong and those who did the wrong, coming together to acknowledge that something took place, right? Forgiveness is more than just shaking your hands out and give your brother or sister, because that just proves that one did it quicker than the other. But that's not what it is. It's a gathering of each person, right, to say, hey, listen, I forgive you. Uh, he says, I think in, in that context, he says, I am Joseph. So he identified who he was. Mm -hmm who you sold into slavery. Right? That's who I am. So let me admit who I am, what you did, and then you admit that you did it, and let's see if we can move on to forgiving one another so we can grow together. Church, that's what we need to do in order to matriculate or to grow together. We must forgive one another. The greatest forgiveness of all, we all admitted in my, in my lesson, that Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Out of all uh, demoralizing him, dehumanizing him, right? Lying on Jesus, uh, trying to legitimize their wrongness by putting them on the old rugged cross. Yet still, Jesus still hangs there at Calvary and says, Forgive them, Father. Well, they don't even know what they're doing. Right? So, the greatest forgiveness of all is God forgiving us. Mm. Amen. So, how can God forgive us and we not forgive one another? How can we even worship and praise God who, ne who we have never seen? Right? And say so we love the Lord, but can't forgive one another we see every day. We talked about that. And then we said that forgiveness has a brother. A brother that's inseparable to him. And we look at him as brothers. And that is forgetting. Forgetting. Forgetting and forgiveness is like building a solid house. I did that wonderful drawing for you last week on the board. Did y'all take a picture of that drawing? Well, it's gone now. But y'all got to remember the drawing that I did. And I said that forgetting is just as important as forgiving. Because really, you can't have one without having the other. Why well, forgive you? Uh, over the history and the, and the annals of time, I can't forget. Well, you admitted last week, and I had to admit to you, it's hard to forget. Especially when you're always trying to kick me in the teeth, right? It's hard, brothers and sisters that's watching, to forget. So how does one forget? Well, I can't lay out the, the best laid plans of forgetting, but I tell you, 
if you live by God's oracles and you forgive, this is how forgetting happens. Forgetting is like, forgiving is like building a solid foundation and forgiving, I mean forgetting is like building that house on that foundation toward God. And the closer we get to God, the more what you've done to me in the past, some of that stuff I can't even remember no more. Can anybody testify to me today? You don't have to raise your hand, but just think about it. Man, so much stuff don't happen between what you did and, mm -hmm. and, and, and how it worked out. And uh, I've been doing my, uh, where I'm at now is not where I was then. I'm closer to God. I'm a Christian. God has saved me. God has prepared me and is preparing me. Man, I can't forget. I can't even remember what you did. Now, if you show up and start talking about it, we're going to have a conversation. So we admitted that forgetting is a little bit more difficult, but hey, we got to work on it. And last but not least about forgetting, we talked about forgetting happens over time. I can't just forget about it like uh, six months from now. And I'm not here to give people a false hope when it comes to the scriptures. It takes time. Right? It takes time to forget. Not to forget it, but to forget it. That stuff happened to me in high school and college. I can't even remember that stuff no more. You know why? Because there have been so many engagements that I've had in my life over these many years that whatever happened then, unless you wrote it down in a, 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 your manifesto and give it to me, yeah, I can remember. I can re it'll come back up again. So let's move on, brothers and sisters. We got to move on from uh, forgiving and forgetting. We say they are inseparable. They are like twin brothers. But there's a third child. There's a third child in this act of, of opening our minds and our hearts to God. And this, the one I'm teaching tonight, is so important to me. And I hope it's so important to you that I got to do two nights on it. I did one night on forgiving, one night on forgetting, but I'm going to take two nights on reconciliation. Y'all write that down, man. Those who have the syllabus, reconciliation. To be reconciled to your brother and or sister. All right? What does it mean to be reconciled? Reconcile, let's see. Pursuing reconciliation means to bring back into unity again. It means to bring back into unity again. And I'll leave it like that. We can go and go on and on and on about it. But let's just keep it simple. In that unity, it means harmony. It means agreement. What has been alienated. In other words, reconciliation is something happened that we became estranged from one another. Husbands become estranged from their wives. Wives from their husbands. Brothers against brothers. Sisters and brothers. They get estranged from one another. Friends are estranged from one another. They're alienated from one another because of something that happened. Right? Reconciliation, that word re, is a prefix. In school they taught me that re is a prefix that means to do something over again. Right? It means to do something over again. And when you are unified or pursuing unification again, it brings about harmony. It brings about harmony. Right? That goes... Uh, for us, that goes to our relationship with God. We were estranged from God. I'm going to talk about this tonight in depth. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters that's watching y'all this here tonight, we were estranged from God by us. Sin. We sing it. We sing it in our song. Sin has left a crimson stain, which separated us from the one who created us. The creator and the creature were separated, not because of God, but because of us. Us wanted to be like God, right? And we can take that all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, that we all wanted to be like God. That tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And the powerful thing that God has given all of his children, the power of choice, right? Not predestination, we can talk about that some other lesson, but I'm talking about the power of choosing, right? So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Y'all remember that chapter? Y'all highlight that. Read it during your Bible study this week. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And it talks in essence about uh, through Christ, God was doing what? Through Christ, 
through Jesus Christ, God was doing what? Reconciling. The act of reconciliation. He was, here is God, here is us, or the world. There was a big gap between God and us because of that word right there, because of sin. So God sent his son Christ, Jesus, we call him Jesus Christ. We call him Jesus Christ, the Christ. God sent his son to the world, reconciling the world back into himself. So God sent Jesus, who is the express image of an invisible God who came down to us to see about us, to get us right, to take us all back to God. <laughs> Amen. God was in that make me kind of happy tonight to know that, that I taught, I uh, preached it a couple Sundays ago, that he's a personal God. He's a personal God, and the act of God is the act of reconciliation. So you cannot forgive, forget, without bringing that extremement back to unity again. And when you come back to unity again, oh Jesus, it's like the prodigal son coming back home. Amen. Amen. It's about the shepherd that goes to find the lost sheep who was estranged from the sheepfold, but when the shepherd found the sheep, it was reconciliation. And he tells that sheep, you don't even have to walk back to the sheepfold. I'm going to put you on my shoulder. Ooh, I see it, man. I, I love that stuff, right? It's like the woman, even an inanimate object called a coin, but when she found that coin, she was reconciled to that which was precious in her life. And because it was precious to her, she wanted everybody to come rejoice with her for that which was lost was not found. But you can find reconciliation all in the Bible. Mary and Martha were so happy when Lazarus came back to life again. They were separated by his death. But when Jesus comes along, he is reconciled. And not only, I'm going to talk about this too, not only reconciling us back to God, but reconciling us back together as brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, y'all yeah, yeah, remember COVID. COVID extrained us from one another. You said, well, Pastor, don't say it like that. We were not. We had a uh, brush fire. We had all these other stuff. No, no. Yeah, thank God for brush fire. Thank God for all of the social media that we had. But we were extrained from, the, from one another because when I sang at home, I couldn't sing with you. How they said that too. When you praise God in your own home, I know what you were doing. You were drinking your coffee. You had your house roll with your house shoes on, like I did. I ain't gonna I ain't come to lie to you tonight because I know how we are. There was an extreme uh, bit with the people of God because it went against the oracles of God and said, Come let us reason together. How can I reason with you on brush fire? How can I say amen and you say amen? We raise our hand and sing praises of Zion together. We needed to be reconciled and COVID-19, COVID-19, stopped it, put a halt to it. Had nothing to do with forgiving or forgetting, but it had something to do with extreme man, and alienated. And that's why I tell my camera all the time as I get ready to dwell into this lesson, is that when God removes the barrier and you can come back, you ought to celebrate, because I missed y'all and you missed me, so when we come back from that extreme, we ought to celebrate God together. For that which was separated has now come back together, Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church, and whatever church you may wish. Okay. Unfortunately, discord has been a problem for humanity when the fall, or excuse me, since the fall. Since the fall, there's been this word called discord. A word that we don't like to use all the time, but it's, it's a word that we use in our churches. It's called discord. And ever since the fall of humanity, this, this word discord has been our plight. We have it in some of our bylaws in the Baptist church. And if somebody so sees a discord in the church, man, we have reason, a legitimate reason enough, and I don't do this. I know we used to do it a long time ago. Excommunicate. I even hate that word. Excommunicate people from the congregation because they so sees a discord. 
That means they talk about the church, they talk about the brothers and sisters, they talk about the pastor, they lay, they lay the church low, they call us nothing, whatever, whatever. You plant seeds of discord to hurt the bread that feeds you every Sunday. You hurt the water that gives you spiritual water every Sunday. Why? You sow seeds of discord. And ever since the fall of humanity, that has been our plot. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, discord became one of the significant consequences. The woman would desire to control the husband, and the husband would try to dominate his wife. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Y'all see that? The woman desired to control the husband. And the husband would try to dominate her. This dysfunction, see, discord and dysfunction. This dysfunction gave birth to every kind of relational conflict. Brother against brother. Huh? Y'all remember in the Bible, y'all remember any stories where you had brothers against brothers? Can I get a witness here? Cain and Abel. To one brother has such a conflict with his other brother that he killed him out in the field. Esau, Jacob, right? brother against brother, sister against sister, neighbor against neighbor, ethnic group against ethnic group, and nation against nation. You find that in dysfunction and in discord. Sin. The power of choice has left an indelible stain on all of us. Uh, we still struggle with discord in our families. Some family members ain't spoke to each other in years. Why? And you know what? We talk about forgetting, and you ask, well, why aren't you speaking to grandma? Or why aren't you speaking to a mama? Why aren't you speaking to sister and brother? You talking about forgetting? Some people in their family have spoken to to each other so long, they don't even know why they're not speaking to one another. <laughs> why are you speaking to mama? Uh, uh, see what I'm saying? Well, you ain't speaking to mama because you chose not to speak to mama. You can't even remember. Friendships? Girl, we were friends a long time ago. Remember we went to high school together? Brother, you know, you were my ace boom coon in high school. We ran the street together. We went to the juke joint together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we were friends. But then you took my girl. <laughs> now, Sally Sue was mine. Oh, my. Yeah. And you saw discord in our friendship. I ain't gonna ever let you forget it. Years in your workplace, you find discord in the workplace. People have been extreme in the workplace. <laughs> And sometimes you get extreme, not by what you did, but because they got a promotion that you thought you should have. <laughs> and so you sow discord. I've been here 30 years, she's been here 5 years, and yet she get a promotion over me. Discord. Sin, choice, discord. Oh, excuse me. It should be choice, sin, discord. Okay. Church, uh oh. You find extreme men in the church. Why did he choose me to be a trustee? Who he think he is? He the new pastor on the block. He ain't been there here for six months. Mm -hmm. Trustees against the deacon. Deacons against the trustee. Larity against everybody. Sunday school teacher can't get along with the Sunday school class because they keep disagreeing with him or her. <laughs> of course, you know, I'm exaggerating. Well, maybe not. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> You got nations fighting against nations, trying to overthrow governments, trying to overthrow land, genocide all over the place. Choice, sin, discord. Alienated, estranged, extrained from one another. How can we achieve? How can we do this? We talk about reconciliation. How do we achieve reconciliation? How can we achieve reconciliation and renew our relationship with one another? All we have is each other. We were made for each other. God made us to have fellowship with each other. But brother, something happened between you and I. 
sister, something happened between now that that fellowship has now been extreme. Christ died for our sins to reconcile our relationship with God and our relationship with others, Ephesians chapter 2. Y'all read Ephesians chapter 2 when you get a chance. The act of reconciliation, dear brothers and sisters, listen to me closely, is not just about you and God, but it's about me and you, or you and I. That's what it's about. You don't talk to me no more. You don't come and shake my hand no more. You don't call me and text me no more. I don't hear from you no more. Right? There's something that happened between you and I that's not good, that's not right. And it's not that we have to be the best of friends. I have to call each other every day, but you're still my brother and my sister. That's why the indelible question that still looms in the world today, am I my brother's keeper? Or in this case, am, are we each other's uh, keepers? Okay. This means eliminating racism, ethno ethnocentrism, elitism, caste systems, and other forms of social division. You see, there's an extreme in the nation, brothers and sisters, on ethnic groups. Uh, there's a separation over in, in different countries and, uh, called the caste system, uh, where they are not equal at all. They're high and they're low in the caste system. And depending on where you fall in that caste system, caste system depends on if you have priority over things or not. Um, As Christians, we must do our best to live at peace with others as far as it, as far as it depends on us. we got to live peaceful with one another. And brothers and sisters, living peaceful with one another, listen to me closely, doesn't mean we always have to agree on the same thing because we're not clones. <laughs> Amen. Even when we have our church meetings, when we have our meetings at our, our huddles, at our workplace, right? Uh, even in, in our political realm, where it seems like that becomes an impossibility every day, you got to find, or we got to find a happy medium that makes it work for the whole body. Husband and wives, you got to find what makes it work for the home. We got to find out what makes it work for the workplace. That's why you have huddles. Trisha talks to me all, all the time. I think Deacon is full of talks about when she was to work. You had huddles and stuff. Why do you, you don't have huddles just to look at one another? <laughs> and anybody ever been in a meeting or a huddle, y'all just looked at each other and didn't say nothing? Well, what you do when you get in the huddle, you try to go through the highs and lows, the positives and the negatives. What worked, what didn't work? What can we best do to, to move this program forward? And people get estranged, dear brother, because it ain't go my way. Well, you don't really have a way in God's house. It's about God's way. And God uses us as vessels to make it work in whatever branch of Zion you wish it in. Uh, uh, although sometimes reconciliation may not be possible due to the actions of the other party, we must strive to pursue it the best to the best of our ability. Now, reconciliation, that's what makes it difficult. Because the other party don't want to come into an agreement that something happened. But we have to try to do our best to pursue it with all that we have. So in the end, you can say, and I can say, or we can say collectively, we did the best we could. Don't, uh, we should sing on a secular song. Uh, I know it's baby boomers. We remember it. Ain't no half-stepping. Y'all looking at me, yeah. That's not a Sam Cooke song, y'all, okay? That's an old rap song. Ain't no half-stepping. <laughs> y'all Hey, y'all on Facebook, y'all can't see what they just looking at me laughing. But y'all know what I'm talking about. They don't have stepping in God's ministry. It's all for God or nothing at all. Not lukewarm. So we must strive to pursue it, pursue it to the best of our ability. I can't pursue it to the best of your ability because our abilities are different. But whatever God gives us as gifts in the Holy Spirit, Use those gifts to try to find a happy medium. And I'm not talking about, when you're finding a happy medium in reconciliation, I'm not talking about giving up your integrity, giving up spiritual dignity, right? I'm not talking about that. Because some things you cannot compromise with, no matter what it's in. 
And you got to stand on being transparent when it comes to that. That I can't lose what God has given me just to make peace with you. I want to make peace with you based on what God is doing in me and expressing to you. So I'm not going to give up the right for the wrong just so we can be friends, although I'm still pursuing reconciliation. How should we pursue reconciliation? How should we pursue it? We learn extensively from Joseph's reconciliation with his brother. So we're going to go back to the story. After 22 years, listen, brother and sisters, he and his brothers, if you do your historical studies from the scripture, were separated for 22 years. Now that goes back to forgiving and forgetting because Joseph forgave in 22 years he was so busy being second in command he probably forgot a lot of this stuff until they showed up. Because as I said last week, last, uh, week his overall way of thinking was God sent me here for good. So if God, if I connect my a life and connect my mind, although I was wrong, to that God was in control of it all, then forgetting should be a big issue for me. Because if it wasn't for God sending me here, everybody would be dead because everybody would have starved to death. So he looked at the bigger picture, and plus when you second in command in a, a, a big old, a powerful uh, a country, not country, excuse me, uh, Nation like Egypt, I use that nation like Egypt, you ain't got time to worry about the pit and pat stuff. Because now you in God and God is in you and you got work to do. Right? So this is what Joseph was saying. Joseph was saying, in essence, God did it for good. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, so tonight I'm just going to do it with just two. I got four, but we're just going to deal with two tonight. Because number one, we're going to deal with. To pursue reconciliation, we must pursue change in ourselves and others. Let me say that one more time. Number one, we're going to talk about uh, to pursue reconciliation, pursuing it. I didn't say you had it yet. I said you're pursuing it. <laughs> we must pursue change in me, change in you, and others. So turn with me, uh, brothers and sisters, to Genesis chapter 44, verses 33 and 34. Again, let me give you biblical, a biblical context on why we must pursue change in ourselves and others. Genesis chapter 44, verses 33 and 34. And I will be reading from the New International Version for those who may have a different version. Beginning at 33. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, don't let me see the misery that will come on my a change in others and a change in ourselves. God had helped Joseph forget the pain and caused by his brothers in their household. However, Joseph knew that forgiveness alone was not enough for reconciliation. So it's more than forgiveness. It's more than forgiveness uh, to take place. In other words, forgiveness is one thing. That's based on the individual. That's based on you with me. Forgive you, you forgive me. You forgive me, I forgive you. But it, reconciliation is more than that. It's more than that. It has to do with what the scripture that we just read means. It says, the brothers had to change their abusive and selfish ways. So in order for reconciliation to take its proper course as we pursue it, some of our ways has to change. 
You can't not, you can't not just forgive somebody and still act the same way. For if you do that, it's sound and fury signifying nothing. It's nothing but words. So what Joseph was doing, he was putting his brothers, read the story, he was putting his brothers to, to a test. Listen, he was putting his brothers, after 22 years, he was putting his brothers to a test. Because you remember, they must go through this test uh, because they were abusive to him, uh, they were selfish toward him, and they threw him into slavery, or they put him in a pit to be auctioned off or to be given to another nation, the Midianites, right? So here, the brothers had to show in this test that their abusive ways had changed in order for reconciliation to happen, because if they still walked into Joseph's court in Egypt with the same mindset that they had, this would have never taken place. He could have forgiven them, he could have uh, forgot some of it, but they still would have been reconciled because they would have still had that same old slave dehumanizing people mentality. <clears throat> to test their character, Joseph showed them great love by providing them with abundant resources without any charge. So when they went back to Jacob and he released them to go back to Joseph to his father, he gave them wagons, horse, he gave them, read the story, he gave them all these, all these amenities to take back to his father. Despite this, he tested them to see if they had truly changed. Right? And I forget which one of the brothers, let me see if I can find it. Um, um, I forget which one of the brothers, and I don't have it here, brothers and sisters, y'all forgive me. I guess I didn't study that hard. I don't know if it was Judah. It could have been Judah. Uh, well, if you go back to verse 16 of chapter 44, if you go back to verse 16 of chapter 44, uh, what can we say to my Lord? Judah replied, what can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves are the one who was found to have the cup. That's when he hid that cup in Benjamin's uh, back, back, right? And so they were willing to give themselves up to save Benjamin because they knew how much Jacob loved Benjamin, who was the youngest son, and Joseph loved Benjamin, right? And so to prove that, he tested them. He put a golden vessel, a very expensive vessel, and I would just say for right now uh, to make relevance to the day like a backpack. Back sack, and it was found, and and Joseph, not Joseph, excuse me, uh, yeah, Joseph, he tested them, and they became humble in front of their brother, right, because they knew that Benjamin was very important to their father Jacob. So they offered they who had sold him as slavery now themselves begged to be slaves. <laughs> Y'all pray with me. See, listen. That's why I said that the top of this one, we must pursue change in ourselves and others. And guess what? They passed the test. They passed the test. They whipped those old arrogant brothers uh, from 22 years ago. Over the years, over the annals of their existence, they saw a need. They were going to starve to death. Joseph set them up on this test. They pass the test. But I want to give you another example because we can say man to that oh hallelujah Jesus uh, that his brothers you know showed that it was a change in others. A change in themselves in order for reconciliation to happen. But I got to, I wrote this down. That's why this I had to do it in uh, two parts tonight and next week. Is let's look at David. Let's look at what happened to King David. I know this kind of getting off the beaten path a little bit. But I got to I got to rub against what went well with Joseph and his brothers in the end, and what happened to the second greatest king of Israel, David. When David's son Amnon raped his daughter, David did nothing. He didn't change himself. He didn't change the way he thought. Amnon's actions 
caused David's other son, Absalom, to kill Amnon and then flee from the family. Right? So you had uh, Murray in David's house. Right? And we, we're not forward to that prophecy by Nathan that a sword should never leave his home. That was the prophecy. But let's look at the story. Eventually, Absalom was restored to the kingdom, but David never disciplined or communicated with him. He just left him alone. So how, dear brothers and sisters, let me ask you this, let me ask you this qualitative question. How was reconciliation going to happen if David didn't do nothing? He didn't, he didn't do anything. Absalom don't kill his son. Right? The soil was passing through his house. And it said David never disciplined with him like Joseph did with his brother. He never communicated with him. He just left him alone. And when you leave stuff alone and don't communicate, this would never happen. You just, well, whatever. I hope they don't do it again. Or do you find people in ministry that are not confrontational leaders? I don't mean confrontational as it as uh, uh, looks like uh, being a dictator or nothing like that. I'm saying identifying that a wrong was done. Je Joseph said, I am Joseph whom you put in slavery. Let's identify this thing so we can get together and have these three, these three things out. But David never did it. Then. Uh, and so what happens is... Then eventually Absalom tries to kill David. So because David didn't do that, his son tried to kill him. He never disciplined him, right? Just think of your parents. Your parents told you not to get the apple out of the apple tree, right? Mm -hmm. But John, you, you go tell your mother, well, Dan went to get the apple out of the apple tree. And then your darling mother never disciplined Dan. So he think he can go to the apple tree again, and then he beat John up for telling him. I don't know if it happened that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's because it never was dealt with. <laughs> Brother says I say that because I got one of my favorite people here tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and so so but two niggas they, they never can reconcile because it was never addressed that a wrong took place. Uh Absalom tries to kill David, and not only does he try to kill David, he tries to take over the kingdom. By never dealing with the son's sins, there was no reconciliation in his family. Just pacification. You know what that means? He just pacified. Oh, he didn't mean to do it, or she didn't mean to do it. Uh, it's kind of like, have y'all ever seen on TV, I hope I'm talking to somebody tonight, a child or a young person kill somebody. I shot them for no reason at all. And I'm saying this because we, this has been our reality, at least since I've been in the world. You turn on the news and a child purposely kills somebody for no reason. The first thing the parent says is what? He or she is a good child. Oh boy, that takes everything I have to keep from turning the TV on and playing. The first thing the parent does is not, I'm talking about, is on film. Somebody caught the child killing somebody on Facebook, you know how we use these phones. And your parents never address that this child, or your baby as you call him, did something wrong. You pacify him or her by saying, oh, I didn't raise him like that. We didn't say that. We didn't say you didn't raise him like that. All we're looking at is the results of what this child did. They don't kill somebody, they will rob somebody. And the first thing a parent does is, oh, they're a good child. Well, tell me, what good is it in robbing somebody and killing somebody? Like David, you, you, you pacify it, and reconciliation never happens between your child and the person's child that they killed. Or you took somebody out of the community by choice, by robbing from them, stealing and killing from them. Listen, eventually the unresolved conflict blew up in David's face. He never had peace in his home. And the reason I give the road back beside Joseph, you said Joseph ended peacefully when things were acknowledged. Uh, the pursuit of reconciliation happened when there was a change in oneself and others. And the thing I wanted to say is we all have flaws. All of us. Pastor Galman, all of you that are listening, all of us. We all have character flaws. 
And it's easy to tolerate unhealthy relationships and behaviors when we struggle with them. But we can learn from David's example and strive to grow and improve ourselves. Whether in dating, marriages, parent-child relationship, workplaces, or friendships, we should never settle for anything less than we deserve. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you don't want nobody to talk to you nasty and dirty, don't you talk to them nasty and dirty. If you want, to treat, if you want somebody to treat you nice and lovely, you treat people nice and lovely. Even if we have negative views about ourselves or past failures that make us feel unworthy, it's never too late to work on our character and build healthy relationships. Remember, we hold the power to change our lives for the better. Let me go back to this. We hold the power, y'all, to change our lives for the better. That comes with choice. You don't, listen, brothers and sisters that are listening to me tonight, I don't mean no harm. You don't have to be where you are. You choose to be where you are. Ah, well, no, Pastor, it's their fault. Look at, look at what they've done to me. They're the reason, no, well, hold on for one second. Well, if they are the reason where you are today, then they got power over you. And you know, one thing I don't want people to have over me, the only person I want to have power over me is my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't want nobody to have no power on me when I choose to do what I do and to live. Uh, what was it Flip Wilson used to say? The devil made me do it. <laughs> Isn't that what Flip Wilson used to say? Amen. The devil don't have that much power. Oh, that, well, the devil don't have power over God, period. So whose are you? You're a child of God. You make the choice. Like, if you want to move from your situation, get a job and save some money. Yeah. Pastor, don't talk to me like that. No, that's practical. That's practical. Right? If you want to have a, a car, if you want to have a nice dress or a nice suit, you work for it. You don't go around stealing stuff. Oh, uh, I, uh, my child in jail, they in jail. Well, they in jail because they made the choice to be in jail. Right? Listen, listen. Remember, we have the power to change our lives for the better. You know, that's why I, I, I beg and I plead with people to look at your life. Look at where you were. Look at where you are now. And where do you want to be? And if you say you can't, you won't. But if you like the little train that they taught me when I was a little boy, I think, going to the hill, was that it? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And then when he got over, he said, I know I could, I knew I could, I knew I could. So let's be the little train that's going, going up the hill tonight. Not only do you think you can, but I choose that I will. Genuine reconciliation can only be achieved when both parties genuinely repent of their doings. It all begins when the gossip stops spreading rumors, the wife stops criticizing, the husband stops using harsh words, and the offended party stops holding a grudge. A change in character is crucial for both parties to pursue true reconciliation. Remember, brothers and sisters, character change is not only necessary for ourselves, but also for others. So to pursue reconciliation, let's look at me, and you look at you, and if something happened between us, in order to really reconcile, let's get together and discuss it. Because right? I miss you, right? I miss you. I miss being around you. I miss the fellowship that we had, you know. I, 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 I regret that a thread separated us. I regret that a drop a day split us apart. And when I really think about it in my forgiving and forgetting, I say, well, that's good, but I got to reconcile because I, I miss hanging out with you. Here's the last one. Number two, to pursue reconciliation, we must focus on God's sovereignty, not others' failures. We must focus on God's sovereignty. You see, reconciliation comes from the top. That's God. And not focus on others' failures. Well, where do you get that from, Pastor? Well, turn with me to Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 9. Genesis 45, verses 1 through 9. 
Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. In other words, they were like, what? <laughs> he who we dehumanize now rules over us. And if he can remember what he did, what we did to him, and how deploring of a situation it was, we're terrified. Because now he's over us. And not over us, but he's the only one that can give us grain to preserve life. Let's go on. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there would be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead. Y'all highlight that verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you. Look, 22 years ago. <laughs> Woo! He says, uh, to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Y'all read deep into that, what he said. Because remember, Israel were the covenant people of God. And they had to be preserved down the annals of history so the greatest king could come. If they would have died off because of starvation. So that is a deep, right there, announcement, proclamation. To preserve a remnant on earth. He's talking about them. Mm -hmm. Right? And to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here. See, this is, this is where this takes place. Y'all stay with me, Mount Calvary. Stay with me, coming. I'm, I'm done. Listen. In other words, forgiving, forgiving, and reconciliation is not about you sending me here. <laughs> That's not what he said. He said, but God allowed me to come here. See, God's will and what God allowed are two different things. It's not God's will for any to perish, but for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. But sometimes God allows things over the annals of history and in our experiences in life uh, for his good. So in other words, let's go back 22 years, brothers and sisters. Let me take you back. That old song said, take me back. Let's take me back 22 years ago. So if you brothers would have been kind to me because I had the coat of many colors, if y'all would have been good to me, you know, treated me like I was somebody, although we had brothers, but all of us would have died. <laughs> that don't make sense. All of us would have died. Because by interpreting Pharaoh's dream, there were going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And what did I teach like two weeks ago? When the seven years of famine came, they forgot about the seven years of plenty because it was so horrendous. And so he says here, He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. See, dad, you had seen me in a long time, but you're getting ready to see me now. I might look a little different because I've been down here in Egypt like Moses. Moses looked like an Egyptian until God called him to his next powerful task of leading the Hebrew people out of slavery. So I may not look like what I used to, but it's not about how I look. It's about what God is doing. So bring them on down. Bring Dad on down. Right? And let them know while you're talking to him, I am head, second head. Of all of the most powerful nation in the known world. He declares, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold in slavery. Ashamed, shocked, and afraid, they no doubt began to believe his story. Joseph quickly comforts them and says, Now do not be upset and do not be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. 
but God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. <coughs> Joseph aims to comfort them with God's ultimate purpose through their evil act to preserve life. Don't you know what happened to you in the past that you call evil? They did evil to me, Pastor Yama. They treated me dirty. But look at where you are now. Look how that evilness defined who you are in Christ today. Come on, put your hands together and say, man, that, that made a lot of sense right there. The evilness defines your purpose today. He says, from, from verse 5 to verse 9, Joseph mentions God's name four times. And if y'all count another one, let me know. But I count it four times that God's name was mentioned from verse 5 to verse 9. This was classic Joseph. When he met with the baker and the cupbearer, he said, doesn't the interpretation of dreams belong to God? That's number one, chapter 40, verse 8. When he met with Pharaoh, he said, I cannot interpret your dreams, but God can. That's chapter 41, verse 16. Even when Joseph sent his brothers back home, the first time he told them, I fear God. Genesis chapter 42, verse 18. Joseph was a man who saw God in everything. It was... It was who he was. He could hide it, not even in a pagan world that worshipped different gods. Not even when confronting his brothers who sold him into slavery 22 years before. He could hide. Listen, brothers and sisters, they may throw you in prison. They may put you somewhere, but they can never take away who you are. They can't take away your mind. They can't take it. A lot of people that have been incarcerated or in prison... Uh, for wrongdoing or overseas, they're in overseas prison. The thing that keeps them going is they can never define who they are. How did you make it through prison? How did you make it through being incarcerated? Uh, they can never take away my mind. They may have taken away my freedom, but they couldn't take away, I think, how I a reason. And if you're a child of God, no matter what place or position people try to uh, capture you and put you in, they can't take away who you are. I had, there was that sermon I preached a long time ago. I think I preached it at my pastor's uh, pastoral anniversary about the apostle Paul bruised, but not completely broken. Woo! They bruised him, Paul said. They bruised me, but they couldn't break me. It's, that's somebody's testimony tonight. That's Joseph. They bruised me. The Midianites did. Uh, they lied. Uh, uh, Potiphar's, my Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife lied. They bruised me, but they couldn't break me, and look at what God has put me. Look at you today, brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm, I'm done, but look at you today. The reason you're here today, the reason you're inhaling and exhaling today, is not because you sent yourself here, but something happened to catapult us to where we are in this position and place in God today. And you've been walking with him so long, brothers and sisters, and what I mean by so long is not a length of time as we count. It's not about the length of time, but it's about your conviction today. So when I say you've been walking worthy to the vocation to which you are called for a long time, I'm not saying years and months. I'm not doing it like that. I'm not doing it by calendar. I'm doing it by the conviction in your heart. Because it doesn't matter how long you know the Lord, at least you get to know him. Right? The thief on the cross only knew him for a few minutes before he died off the scene, but he was ushered into paradise. Because he recognized Jesus Christ, right? So what I'm saying here, brothers and sisters, even in the perfect world, even Daniel, Shadrach, and Abednego, they did not give up their integrity in God because they were in a pagan land. They didn't fall down and worship that old golden statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, even if he don't save us from this calamity, we not going to bow down to that. They... The country of bogus, bogus laws against Daniel. He said, you can't pray to no other God but our God. Daniel said, open up the window. Because I'm going to pray to my God three times. And they threw him in the lion's den. But the lions became his pillars. Y'all pray with me here. So with Joseph, in this Joseph story, what he said is he said, I recognize that in reconciliation with my brothers, y'all didn't do nothing but, but push God's agenda forward. Y'all push this agenda forward. That's what I say to all of you today. Sure we have ups and downs. Sure we have times of, of inconsistency and complacency. 
Sure, we have times where it feels like nothing is going our way. It's sure we have times it seems like we're trying to make the ends meet, the ends all over the place. But look at where you are in God. Who defines who you are? Show us. I choose God. It is crucial to deeply understand God's sovereignty if we desire to reconcile with others. God is not merely a distant observer who created and left the world to his own devices. Instead, he is intrinsically uh, involved in everything that happens on earth. As Colossians 1.17 tells us, he himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God's sovereignty extends over everything, and he is in complete control. So why are you worried? Why are you fretting? That's it, y'all. Why are you worried? Why are you fretting? God is in complete control. Well, Pastor Gavin, I got a, I, I, uh, Pastor Gavin, I, I, you got some situations and challenges going. We all do. Think about if you had those situations going and you were not a child of God. I don't know what I would do. I don't know about y'all. I see y'all smiling. I, you know, I don't know. That's why I'm so glad the Bible says we have to like folks because everything people do, I don't like. But God says you got to love them, right? And so, those two things, remember those two things. To pursue re reconciliation, we must pursue change in ourselves and others. To pursue reconciliation, we must focus on God's sovereignty, not others' failures. And next week, we got the last two. Next week, we're talking about to pursue reconciliation, we must overcome evil with good. Number four. To pursue reconciliation, we must let go of others' past failures and not continually bring them up. That's going to be a good one. we got to let go of others' past failures and don't continue to bring them up. When you let them go, stop bringing them up. Uh, I ain't going to get into that. Now I'm done. <laughs> Come on, if you love the Lord like I do, one more time, put your hands together. And see you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Covenant Partners, for joining us uh, this evening. Hopefully something was said that pricked our heart, that pricked our minds and to do God's will as we pursue uh, reconciliation. Uh, come back and join us uh, on this coming Saturday for our uh, Call to Care, Words of Empowerment and Prayer. Sunday morning at 9.30 for our teaching Sunday school and 10.30 for our worship experience here at Mount Academy. And if you want to receive, I know I had one person tonight uh, said they wanted to receive one of my uh, syllabus through email, uh, just hit us up on the Facebook page, your email address, and it's easier to follow along if you had it in front of you. But if you have your Bibles, that's, that's okay. But I want to send this to you. I have it logged in my computer. And all you have to do is put your email address in, touch what button, and you have it. And you can follow along with us. And when we're done, when we're done with the series, then you can have it in your portfolio uh, or in your study manuals uh, to pull up at a later time. And so, again, we're praying for all of those who are sick and shut in. We're praying for all of our members here at Mount Calvary, all of our senior saints, all of, our, all of the people that stand in the need of prayer. All of our covenant partners, we're praying for you and your church ministers. Uh, we pray for everybody. The Bible says that we ought to always pray and not faint. That the prayers of the righteous are made of much. So we love you here at Mount Calvary. Uh, may God continue to bless you and keep you in his care until we see each other again. And until then, let us bow our heads in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to share these words, God, these words uh, about reconciliation. Father, it's very important that we understand what it means not only to be reconciled to you, but also to be reconciled with one another. And so, Father God, thank you, God, that the things that we did in our past that happened to us, everything that happened to us, God, we realize that you allowed it to happen, to bring us to the position and the place we are today. And we say glory to your name. Father, we ask that you would bless those who are not feeling well tonight, those who are disenfranchised, the poor, the needy, the ones that are struggling, the ones that are hungry. 
Father God, help us to be vessels in this world that sheds light on those who are hopeless, those who feel like they are still captive by past events. And Father God, I pray as vessels we can still become that salt of the earth that has not lost its savior. Now, Father God, we realize there are many that are in prison that have been falsely accused. Uh, there are many that are in hospitals and nursing homes that cries out every day because they're hurting. I pray comfort and healing in their lives and in their minds. I pray for every church that is represented here this evening. I pray for every covenant partner church members that are watching us and chiming in tonight, whether by teleconference or by Facebook. Father, I pray for Mount Calvary. I pray for all of our membership, from the greatest to the least of us, God. I, I pray that you would continue to help us to focus on this kingdom ministry journey so we can be all that, not that we need to be, but all that you will have us to be, to stay on kingdom purpose for you, to reach out to those who are just hopeless, God, and feel barren in life. Oh, God, we just thank you for tonight, and we just thank you for your presence. And as we end this prayer and leave one another, but never from your presence, be with us and guide us, God. Guide our minds while we run this race. Guide our heart and our feet while we run this race. Because we don't want our running to be in vain. Yes. Thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said amen. Amen. Listen, y'all have a wonderful evening. God bless you real good. Hug somebody telling you love them. And we look forward to seeing you in the next few days here at our call to you. Again, have a wonderful evening. God bless you. And we'll see you real soon.